Welcome back for the break. Uh, we're just going to pick up and, and, and look at this, this, the significance of this period in history. Um, this was, it was called the Victorian era. And uh, the Victorian era was the second half of the 1800s. And it was known as the Age of Women. Victoria, uh, Victorian era was obviously named after Queen Victoria. And other prominent women emerged, like Florence Nightingale and others at this time. Britain was probably the most influential nation on earth at the time, and largely its influence was positive. Uh, just to give you a sense of the, 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 the Christians, the number of Christians in the nation at the time, in the 1851 census, 40% of the UK population were at church. They actually were church attenders. In 1857, a revival broke out that swept two million people into the church over two years. And the revival started in the United States with one million people getting saved. And then it spread to Ulster. And then in 1859 to England and to Scotland. And this revival was called the evangelical awakening. And it's pretty significant because this is the first time that America led the way spiritually and then it impacted Britain. It came from the West to the East, as it were. For hundreds of years leading up to that point, it always operated the other way around. But then the great evangelical awakening came towards the UK from America. And for the last 150 years since then, typically it's been America that's impacted Britain uh, in, in, in biblical Christian matters. So let me introduce you to um, two great leaders at the time, D.L. Moody and Sankey, who was, D.L. Moody was an evangelist and Sankey was hit, the singer and songwriter who would travel with D.L. Moody. And they were instrumental in bringing revival to the UK in the late 1850s. Uh, in America, Interest in true Christianity had waned uh, following the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Uh, but things changed as people started experiencing a revival, especially in the congregational churches, the Presbyterian, the Baptist, and the Methodist churches. And <clears throat> the two names that stand out in this period associated with revivals was D.L. Moody and Charles Finney. D.L. Moody, um, who we're talking about just now, was converted in Chicago, age 20, and leaving a, a career in business, he became an evangelist. Initially among the notoriously wild and ungodly young men of Chicago, um, and Ira Sankey became his music director in 1870, and the two men team had a very powerful evangelistic ministry for, for many years. It's estimated that Moody traveled a million miles and preached around to around 100 million people during his ministry. In 1886, he founded the Moody Bible Institute. And in 1873, Moody and Sankey visited England, Ireland, Wales. They preached to two and a half million people in London alone. Moody and Sankey then visited Glasgow in 1874 and remained there for more than five months. Their meetings on Glasgow Green and in the city halls attracted huge crowds of people. And they returned to Glasgow in 1882 and again in 1891. Uh, D.L. Moody founded the Bible Training Institute in Bothwell Street in 1892 in Glasgow. And then it moved to Byers Road in 1980, and then to eventually St. James's Road in 1998. And th that was th then it was called the International Christian College, but that was originally started by D.L. Moody. Moody first came to Edinburgh in November 1873, and several thousand people turns, uh, had to be turned away from their first meeting on the Sunday evening because the crowds were so big. And um, this is the record from the Scotsman. Uh, and this is what it says in, in one of Moody's visits to Edinburgh in 1892. Moody and Sankey were yesterday in Edinburgh. 
And in connection with their visit, a series of meetings took place in the Free Assembly Hall. And then the, for, the forenoon uh, was then crowded in attendance to hear the address by Mr Moody. Admissions was by ticket up until quarter before 11. But many non-ticket holders put in an appearance so as to block the approaches. A to a large extent, those who had tickets and those who had not tickets were in the same footings as regarded admission. The gathering was so large that it was found necessary to have overflow meetings in the free church. And Mr. Moody, in the address that lasted nearly an hour, spoke on the subject of the Holy Spirit. Interesting, the baptism of the Holy Spirit changed Moody's ministry. D.L. Moody grew up at a time where the idea of the baptism of the Holy Spirit wasn't commonly understood, but he had an experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit. He, he was already an evangelist. He was already winning souls to Jesus. But after this experience, his evangelistic methods changed and actually the effectiveness of his evangelism went to another level. And this is, this is an excerpt from uh, the book, A Passion for Souls, The Life of D.L. Moody by Lyle Dorset. And this is the excerpt, it says, after he surrendered his life to Christ, he began going after souls with an intensity that knew no bounds. In those early years, after um, he gave up his business to devote himself full-time to evangelism, he made a point to witness to someone every day. He would never go into bed, never going to bed until he inquired of someone's, uh, about his or her's eternal destiny. This was ambition for souls that knew no rest. As the years passed, especially after his profound experience with the Holy Spirit in New York in the early 1870s, Moody changed his ministry methods. No longer did he grab the unsuspecting man or woman to inquire about the condition of his soul. It was not that Moody had become indifferent like so many Christians after a few years of the conversion. No, he had merely decided to listen to the Holy Ghost and to ask him to point to the souls that he had prepared for the message. Listening for that direction to the right harvest field rather than entering a field and ask God to ripen it. It was a subtle but profound change in Moody's approach. One can debate his biblical strategy of fulfilling the Great Commission, but no one can deny the fruitfulness of Moody's new approach. D.L. Moody, every day of his life, the story goes, prayed for a hundred people that he knew who didn't yet know Jesus. Every day he'd pray for them by name that they would get saved. When he died, 96 of the people he'd been praying for had come to faith in Jesus. And at his funeral, the remainder four who he'd been praying for at the funeral gave their lives to Jesus. D.L. Moody said about um, his own death, he said, someday you will read in the papers that Moody is dead. Don't believe a word of it. At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. I was born of the flesh, 1837. I was born of the spirit, 1855. That which is born of the flesh may die. That which is born of the spirit shall live forever. It was reported that Moody's farewell words to his sons as he laid upon his deathbed were, if God be your partner, make plans large. And as a result of the revival that, uh, that Moody and uh, the Moody's ministry had triggered, there were a number of key influential leaders emerged, like the next person I'm going to speak about, which is Dr. John Bernardo. And again, you, you, might, you might have gone recently to Bernardo's charity shop and Bernardo's came from this great person. Age 16, Bernardo, John Bernardo came to faith in Jesus. Just before his 17th birthday, he decided to become a medical missionary in China. And so he set out for London in 1866 to train as a doctor at the London Hospital in Whitechapel. Victorian London in the 1800s, it was a city with many social problems. After the Industrial Revolution, the population had dramatically increased, uh, and much of this increase was concentrated in the East End, where there was overcrowding, bad housing, 
unemployment, poverty and disease were rife. A few months after Bernardo, Dr. Dr. Bernardo arrived in London, an outbreak of cholera swept through the East End of London, killing more than 3,000 people and leaving families destitute. Thousands of children were sleeping in the streets and many were forced to beg. One evening in London, a beggar boy named Jim Jarvis came to his door and asked if he could, if he could stay the night. Dr. Bernardo asked him, well, what would your mother say? And the, Jim Jarvis said, I ain't got no mother. And what, what would your father say? And he replied, I ain't got no father. Well, where do you live? And the boy said, I don't live nowhere. And he's, Dr. Bernardo asked, and are there others like you who don't live nowhere? And the boy replied, eeps and eeps of them, sir. And Dr. Bernardo said, well, take me to see them. So Jim Jarvis took... Um, Bernardo around the east ends of London, showing him the children sleeping on the roofs, uh, sleeping on roofs and in gutters. And he was permanently impacted by what he saw. He gave up his plans of going to China as a missionary. And in 1870, uh, Bernardo opened up his first home for boys in Stephanie Causeway, training boys in carpentry metalwork, shoemaking, which enabled the boys to secure an apprenticeship and work, not just bringing them out off the street, but helping bringing them out of poverty. At, at Bernardo's, at first, Bernardo limited the number of boys who could use a shelter. However, one evening, an 11-year-old boy, John Summers, was turned away because the shelter was full. Two days later, John Summers was found dead and the cause of his death was malnutrition and exposure. From then on, Bernardo vowed never to turn another child away. And that became their motto. The motto was no destitute child ever refused admission. Today, Bernardo's <clears throat> is a huge organization in the UK. And it's the UK's leading children's charity. Praise God for Bernardo. And then there's William Booth, another leader who emerged uh, in the 1860s. The back of revival was William Booth. Originally a Methodist mil uh, minister, William and his wife Catherine founded together the Salvation Army. Initially, the goal of uh, Catherine and William wasn't to start a church. That's why they never baptize people and they don't have communion. His aim initially was to get people saved and then point them to churches. Uh, but because of his evangelistic methods, they were so unconventional uh, that he was eventually pushed out of the Methodist church. And that meant he had to start his own thing. And that, thus the Salvation Army was born in 1878. Uh, and Booth was the first general. He organized the church like an army in uniform. While initially the Salvation Army faced much opposition, um, in time the movement prospered and eventually spread to many countries. Um, this is an excerpt from an interview someone had with William Booth, and it gives you an, ins uh, an insight into his heart and his passion. When I looked into his face and saw him brush back his hair from his brow and heard him speak of the trials and conflicts and vict uh, the victories, I said, General Booth, tell me, what has been the secret of your success? He hesitated a second, and then I saw tears come into his eyes and steal down his cheeks. And then he said, I will tell you the secret. God has all that there was of me to have. There have been men with greater opportunities. But from the day that I got the poor of London on my heart and a vision for what Jesus Christ could do, I made up my mind that God would have all that there was of William Booth. And if there is any power in the Salvation Army today, it is because God has had the adoration of my heart, all the power of my will, and all the influence of my life. I learned from William Booth that the greatness of a man's power is the measure of his surrender. The motto for the Salvation Army is blood and fire. And it's known for aggressive street evangelism, mostly among the poor, social action, 
uh, provision for down and outs, finding lost relatives and so on. Also strong teaching on holiness. And again, another great leader at that time was Hudson Taylor, 1832 to 1905. Another person impacted from the revivals of the 1850s. 18 years old, Hudson Taylor wandered into his father's library and read a gospel tract. He couldn't shake its message. And finally, falling on his knees, he accepted Christ. Age 21, he headed for China on his first mission. Uh, and the story goes that on his first mission trip, as the ship neared the channel between the southern Malay Peninsula and the island of Sumatra, the missionary heard an urgent knocking on his cabin door. He opened it and there the captain of the ship stood. Mr. Taylor, he said, we have no wind and we are drifting towards an island where the people are heathen and I fear they are cannibals. What, or what can I do? Asked Taylor. And the, and the captain said, I understand that you believe in God. I want you to pray for winds. Taylor responded, all right, captain, I will, but you must set the sail. So the captain was, uh, the captain was agitated and said, why, that's ridiculous. There's not even the slightest breeze. Besides, the sailors will think I'm crazy. Nevertheless, the captain finally agreed. 45 minutes later, he returned to find the missionary still on his knees. You can stop praying now, said the captain. We've got more wind than we know what to do with. <laughs> Originally, Hudson Taylor went to, to China with a missionary organization, but he eventually resigned from that organization because he disagreed with going into debt or asking for money. And he was inspired by George Muller's example of trusting the Lord. And Hudson Taylor's famous quote was this, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supplies. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supplies. So he left the missionary organization and he returned to England. He was 33 years old when he returned. And during a time of prayer on Brighton Beach, the China Inland Mission was birthed in his heart. And he describes it this way. On Sunday, June the 25th, 1865, unable to bear the sight of a congregation of thousands or more Christian people rejoicing about their own security while millions were perishing for lack of knowledge, I wandered out into the sands alone. In great spiritual agony, and there the Lord conquered my unbelief. I surrendered myself to God and to, for his service. I told him that all the responsibility as to issues and consequences must rest with him. And that as his servant, it, it was mine to obey and follow. And his was to direct, to care for and to guide me and those who might labor with me. Need I say that a peace at once flowed into my burdened heart. There and then, I asked for 24 fellow workers, two for each of the 11 inland provinces, which were without missionary, and, and two for Mongolia. And writing the petition on the margin of my Bible I had with me, I returned home with a heart enjoying such rest as it had, not, as it had been a stranger in my heart for months. <clears throat> And on May the 26th, the following year, 1566, Hudson and Maria and their children sailed with the largest group of missionaries ever to sail to China. The Hudsons had no guarantees of salaries. They, they, had no, they made no appeal for funds. And they were to adopt Chinese dress, traditional dress, and they were to press the gospel to the interior. That was their mission and strategy. He lived through the Boxer Rebellion, which is a, was a, an uprising in China, <clears throat> a violent uprising in China in 1899 to 1901. It was an anti-foreign, anti-colonial, anti-Christian, violent uprising. The uh, Boxers, as they were known, they used martial arts and swords and various things. And, and there was many attacks. Many, many Christians were killed. Many Chinese Christians were killed. Many missionaries were kicked out. And the Hudson Taylor's mission alone, the, the China Inland mission that Hudson Taylor led, saw 58 adults and 21 children killed 
uh, in the Boxer Rebellion. When he died in 1905, by the, when he died, there were 825 missionaries in all 18 provinces of China, and their missions had seen 25,000 converts. In 1900, there were only 100,000 Christians in China, and praise God today, there are around 150 million Christians in China. He died just before World War I. Uh, it's interesting, years before communist government, years, years ago, the communist government in China commissioned a, a communist author to write a biography of Hudson Taylor with the purpose of distorting the facts and presenting him in a bad light. As the author was doing his research into Hudson Taylor's life, he was increasingly impressed by Hudson Taylor's character and life. He found it extremely difficult to carry out his assigned task with a clear conscience. So eventually, at the risk of losing his own life, he set aside his pen, he renounced his atheism, and he received Jesus as personal saviour just through reading the testimony of Hudson Taylor's life. Beautiful side story. Praise God for Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor founded the China Inland Mission in uh, 1866, uh, a society that sent out hundreds of missionaries to China and the Far East, uh, now known as the OMF, uh, Overseas Missionary Fellowship. He fundamentally changed how missions were done. Uh, his mission was interdenominational and privately funded. He made a choice to have missionaries from any denomination in his mission. It, and it was the first interdenominational mission organization. He also changed how missions were financed. Individuals had to believe for their own money as opposed to denominations underwriting the mission work. And in the back of the China Inland Mission, other missionary organizations were birthed along similar lines, such as the Africa Inland Mission. In the late 1800s, Britain was leading the way as the main missionary sending nation in the world, but America was catching up. There are now 20 times more missionaries going from America than from the UK today. So praise God for the missionary movements that were going out. Awesome. And let me, let me introduce you to one of the people who became a Christian uh, around this period. This, is, um, uh, this was a, a missionary called Verbach, and, uh, who moved to Nagasaki and uh, was a missionary from the Dutch Reformed Church. And uh, this is the story of the conversion of a man by the name of Okwazi no Kami. Okwazi no Kami was a Japanese feudal lord in 1854. Uh, some European ships had anchored off the coast of Japan, and he and his men were appointed to watch the movements of the foreign ships uh, with suspicion. Um, while on patrol, he noticed something floating in the water and he sent one of his men to pick it up and he discovered it was a waterlogged copy of a Dutch translation of the Bible floating in the waves. Strangely curious to understand what this book was about, he organised and found, after much searching, a Chinese translation of the New Testament and he studied it for 11 years. And anyway, one day, 11 years later, he appeared at the door of Verbach, this, this uh, Dutch reformed missionary, the first Protestant missionary to Japan. And there was Wakazi no Kami with 50 of his men in full regalia. And they asked that they please be baptized. When Verbach said, well, tell me your story. He, des he describes the impact that Jesus had had in his life. And he said this, as he, as he read scripture, he said, I cannot tell you my feelings when for the first time I read the accounts of the character and work of Jesus Christ. I have never heard, seen or imagined such a person. I was filled with admiration, overwhelmed with emotion and was taken captive by the records of his life and nature. Thank God for our brother. And the, the other leader at the time, so the, there was obviously D.L. Moody. He was one of the key figures in the, the evangelical revival. But also the second key leader was a man by the name of Charles Finney. And uh, 
here we have, let's see, oh, there's a glitch. There we go, Charles Finney, 1792 to 1875. Charles Finney, uh, his family settled near Lake Ontario where, they, where he spent most of his teenage years. As a young man, he decided to study law and he trains in the office of a lawyer called Benjamin Wright in Adams, New York. According to his journal, around this time, age 29, he decided that he must settle the matter of his soul's salvation. So he took time out to seek God. One day, having gone alone into the woods, he knelt by a log and wrestled with God in prayer. And he had a conversion experience. And this is how he describes it. All sense of sin, having you know, given his life to Jesus, all sense of sin, all consciousness of present sin or guilt had departed from me. I said to myself, what is this? I cannot arouse any sense of guilt in my soul, as great a sinner as I am. The thought of God was sweet to my mind, and the most profound spiritual tranquility had taken full possession of me. I could now see and understand what was meant by the passage. Being justified by faith, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I could see that the moment I believed, while up in the woods, all sense of condemnation had entirely dropped out of my mind. And from that moment, I could not feel a sense of guilt or condemnation. My sense of guilt was gone. My sins were gone. <clears throat> and I did not feel that I had any more sense of guilt than as if I had never sinned. I went to my dinner and I found myself that I had no appetite to eat. Then I went to the office and I found Squire Wright had also gone to dinner. I went in and shut the door after me. It seemed as if I met the Lord Jesus face to face. I fell down at his feet and poured out my soul to him. I wept aloud like a child and made such confessions that I, I, I could... As, as I, I could choke my utter, I, I choked with my utterance. It seemed to be that I was bathed, I bathed his feet with my tears. I must have continued in that state a good while, but my mind was so much absorbed with the interview to recollect anything that I said. I returned to the front office and found that the fire that I had made with large wood was nearly burned out. But as I turned, I was about to take my seat by the fire. I received a mighty baptism with the Holy Ghost. Without any expectation of it, without ever having thought the thought of it come into my mind, that there was any such thing even available for me, without any recollection that I'd ever heard of such a thing made mentioned by any person in the world, the Holy Spirit descended upon me in a manner that seemed to go through my body and my soul. I, got, I, I could feel the impression like a wave of electricity going through and through me. Indeed, it seemed as if the waves and the waves of liquid love were flowing through me. No words can express the wonderful love that was shed abroad in my heart. And I wept aloud with, tea, with joy and with love. On the morning just described, Finney went into his office and waves of power continued to flood his soul. When Squire Wright came into the office, Finney said a few words to him about the salvation of his soul. And he made no reply but dropped his head and went away. Finney says, I thought no more of it then, but afterwards I found that the remark I had made pierced him like a sword, and he did not recover from it until he was converted himself. Almost every person Finney spoke to uh, during the day that followed was stricken with conviction of sin and afterwards found peace with God. Immediately, Charles Finney gave himself to evangelism with remarkable results. And I quote, but now after receiving this baptism of the Holy Spirit, I was quite willing to preach the gospel. Nay, I found that I was unwilling to do anything else. <laughs> Finney saw incredibly unusual things, signs and wonders. Uh, often people were brought under conviction of sin just by looking at him. Uh, this is one of the stories that Finney was conducting a series of meetings in Utica, near U New York, uh, where more than 500 people by this point had been converted. 
Everyone in the area had heard of what was going on and people were divided. During that time, Finney happened to be visiting a cotton mill in Utica and one of his critics, a young lady, an employee, an employee saw him come in and turned to a co-worker. She made a cynical remark about him and she began to laugh. Charles Finney simply looked at the young lady without saying a word. The Spirit of God convicted her of sin and she began to weep. Soon her, her companion was convicted and began to weep. And a chain reaction occurred, so much so that hundreds began to be overcome by their lost condition and the conviction of sin, and they all started to weep. The fact that Riona, seeing this, was so deeply moved himself that he said, stop the mill and let people attend to religion, for this is more important that our souls are saved than the factory run. And apparently all the, all the workers uh, were assembled in, the, you know, in, in a very large room and it, it was described a, a more powerful meeting I had scarcely ever attended. Within a few days, nearly every employee, around 3,000 people were saved from that factory. Incredible. Incredible. Quite a scary looking guy. <laughs> I mean, um, but people, people just, just, just being in his presence, the Holy Spirit would convict them of sins. Uh, Finney travelled extensively and saw thousands of people turning to Christ. Uh, great ser Charles Finney said this, great sermons lead the people to praise the preacher. Good preaching leads the people to praise the saviour. He developed a systematic method of revival meetings, which he outlined in his books. They became known as the New Measures, and he encouraged an emotional persuasion of people and the use of altar calls, which drew straw, strong criticism with the more people with more reformed leanings. But his results were very clear. Going across to the UK, and um, I'm introduced you to this person, Charles Haddon Spurgeon also known as the Preach of, uh, Prince of Preachers. Uh, Spurgeon was converted age 16 in a Methodist chapel. He quickly rejected his infant baptism and was immersed uh, by, baptized by full immersion the same year. And it wasn't long before he was preaching. He preached 600 times before he was age 20. <laughs> At age 20, he became the pastor of a church in London and the crowds grew. As the crowds grew, he built the Metropolitan Tabernacle in 1861, which seated 6,000 people. At the time, it was Europe's first mega church. Following its construction, uh, the, the first words he preached in the Metropolitan Tabernacle were this. I propose that the subject of the ministry in this house, as long as this platform shall stand, and as long as this house shall be frequented by worshippers, shall be the person of Jesus Christ. I am never ashamed to avow myself a Calvinist. I do not hesitate to take the name Baptist. But if I am asked my creed, I simply say, it is Jesus Christ. He preached in that building for 30 years. 5,000 people gathered each week at the Metropolitan Tabernacle. 20,000 copies of his sermons, transcripts, were sold every week and they were translated into 20 languages. I guess this is in the days before podcasts or uh, YouTube. So there was a huge distribution of his sermons. There wasn't a week passed without someone coming to faith in Jesus from his sermons, from his written sermons, let alone his live preaching in the tabernacle. Uh, one of his sons, uh, one of his sons, Charles, said of his father, there was no one who could preach like my father. His inexhaustible variety, witty wisdom, vigorous proclamation, loving entreaty and lucid teaching with a multitude of other qualities. He must, at least in my opinion, be ever regarded as the prince of preachers. It's interesting when you, if, I don't know if anyone's, any of you have ever read a Charles Spurgeon sermon, you can, you can go on Google and say, Charles Spurgeon's sermon, and you, you get them, you can read them in entirety. If you read them, I mean, it's, they're just, I mean, they're incredible. The, his turn of phrase, his language, his, his ways of describing things are so poetical 
it's almost like poetry. It's so it's so so well written. It's so well described. So powerful. Really, really very articulate in his communication. What's amazing is apparently he would put on his lectern a piece of paper like the size of a business card almost, quite a small piece of paper. And that's what he preached from. All his preaching notes, just a few sentences or a few words were written on a piece of paper and that was in his lectern. And from that, he preached such incredibly eloquent sermons. Incredible. And just a real gift from, from God. Um, it's, this is a quote. I remember when I have preached at different times in the country and sometimes here that my whole soul has agonized over men, Charles Spurgeon said. Every nerve of my body has been strained and I could have wept my very being out of my eyes and carried my whole frame away in a flood of tears if I could but win souls. He had such a passion to seeing people coming to faith in Jesus. And I remember in the early stages in Edinburgh, when you know we had, I don't know, a few dozen people in our church, and it was very rare for anyone to come to faith in Jesus. And I remember being so stirred up by this. That I wanted to see people coming to Christ. And I made a decision that I needed to have both expectation and desperation. So I, start, I started in, in Edinburgh, I started uh, including in every sermon an altar call. So that's what I started doing when I was in my mid-20s, roughly kind of uh, 2002 onwards. We'd already been going four years. There was a small number of people in our church. So every Sunday, I would include an altar call at the end of the preach. And I would always weave the gospel through every message. And I would, I would bring it to a conclusion by sharing the gospel and asking people to respond. And for me, that was almost, it. and I, sometimes I was looking at the crowd and you knew the people and you, you're all Christians. And yet I would still do it. Because for me, it was almost an expression of my faith that, God, I want you to save souls. But you see this absolute hunger and expectation and a desperation in Charles Spurgeon. And I think we're too comfortable in the West. I think people are too comfortable with, uh, all right, that's OK. It's kind of normal. People don't come to Christ. That's not normal. That's not acceptable. And, and there should be a desperation in the hearts of preachers and leaders to see souls saved. The story goes one day that uh, one of the one of the young preachers who was learning to preach at the time came to Charles Spurgeon and he said, Mr. Spurgeon, why is it every time that you preach, someone comes to Christ? But when I preach, it's very rare for anyone to come to Christ. And Charles Spurgeon turned to the a young person and said, so surely you don't expect someone to get saved every time, do you? And the young person replied, well, no, not every time. And Charles Spurgeon said, well, that's the difference between you and I. <laughs> Charles Spurgeon had this expectation. He believed God's going to do it and God responds to faith. And Charles Spurgeon was committed to good theology in his preaching. This is what he said. Spurgeon warned that those who do away with Christian doctrine are whether they are aware of it or not, the worst enemies of Christian living, because the coals of orthodoxy are necessary for the fire of piety. The coals of orthodoxy are necessary for the fire of piety. What does that mean? Well, it's that the, that, that the coals of orthodoxy, the beliefs you have, the truth, the orthodox beliefs you have, are necessary for the fire of piety. That's your lifestyle. So actually, if you're not teaching good truth, then the result in people's lives will not be powerful. So right believing leads to right living. Here's another quote by Charles Spurgeon. This lets you see Charles Spurgeon's high view of scripture. These words are God's. Thou book of vast authority, thou art a proclamation from the emperor of heaven. Far be it from me to exercise my reason in contradicting thee. This book is untainted by any error. It is pure, unalloyed, perfect truth. Why? Because God wrote it. 
He was a very biblical man. Charles Spurgeon eventually moved away from the evangelical alliance because the evangelical alliance supported infant baptism. Here he said, no, well, that's not in the Bible. It's, it's full immersion baptism. He also resigned eventually from the Baptist Union because he saw that there was a compromise starting to happen with the liberal teachings that were coming out of Germany. And he could see that the Baptist Union were going along with it. It's interesting, Charles Spurgeon, many people don't realize this. Uh, while it wasn't commonly known, he was charismatic. And um, here's a few examples of times when he moved in the word of knowledge when he was preaching. On one occasion, Spurgeon broke off from his sermon in the middle of the preaching and pointed to a, a young man in the audience and declared, young man, those gloves you are wearing, you have not paid for them. You have stolen them from your employer. <laughs> anyway, after the service, and obviously uh, this, this young man comes to Charles Spurgeon, pale and agitated. He approached young man and begged to speak with him privately. He placed, placed a pair of gloves on the table and says, it was the first time that I've ever robbed my master. I will never do it again. Uh, you won't ex expose me, sir, will you? It would kill my mother to hear that I've become a thief. <laughs> so powerful. Here's another example. Uh, let me read this to you. I could tell <clears throat> as many as a dozen similar cases in which I pointed at somebody in the hall without having the slightest knowledge of the person or any idea that what I said was right, except that I believe that I was moved by the spirit to say it. And so striking have been my descriptions that the persons have gone away and said to their friends, come and see a man who told me things, all things that I ever did. And beyond doubt, he must have been sent by God to my soul or else he could not have described me so exactly. That's Charles Spurgeon describing times when he pointed at people in the crowds and brought a word of knowledge that had such a profound impact on his life. Charles Spurgeon, he worked incredibly hard um, and he actually died age 57, but he lived the lives of several people in that shortened life. And this is, this is a description of, it, of his life. No one living knows the toil and care I have to bear. I have to look after the orphanage. I have charge of a church with 4,000 members. Sometimes I have marriages and burials to be take, undertaken. And then there is the weekly sermon to be revised. The sword and the trial have to be edited. That was their publication. And besides all that, a weekly average of 500 letters to be answered. I mean, he wrote reply to 500 letters. This, however, is only half of my duty. There are innumerable, there are innumerable churches established by friends with, with, the, with the affairs of which I am closely connected. To say nothing of the cases of difficulty which are constantly being referred to me. Apparently, at his, uh, at his 50th birthday, a list of 66 organizations were read out that he founded and oversaw. Lord Shaftesbury, who, who we heard about earlier, uh, who was at, this, at his 50th birthday, commented, this list of associations were more than enough to occupy the minds and hearts of 50 ordinary men. He typically read six substantial books a week and could remember what he read and where to find it in the book. That's unusual, folks. He produced more than 140 books of his own. For example, uh, The Treasury of David, seven volume work on the Psalms. He often worked 18 hours a day. Uh, the missionary David Livingston once, uh, asked him once, how do you manage two men's work in a single day? Spurgeon replied, you have forgotten. There are two of us. <laughs> in other words, Jesus and him. This is his attitude towards overwork and burnout. Um, I'm not sure I subscribe to this, but nevertheless, it, it's, uh, I, I admire it. If by excessive labor we die before reaching an average age of man, worn out in the master's service, then glory be to God. We shall have much less of earth, but much more of heaven. <laughs> 
And he says, it is our duty and our privilege to exhaust our lives for Jesus. We are not here to be living specimens of men in fine preservation, but living sacrifices whose lot is to be consumed. Very different to today's view of work. Charles Spurgeon suffered a lot. He was slandered. In his early years in London, Spurgeon experienced intense slander. Um, he said this, down on my knees I have often fallen with the hot sweat rising from under my brow and under some fresh slander poured upon me. In an agony of grief, my heart has been uh, well nigh broken. He understood the burden of pastoral ministry. He said this, uh, Spurgeon said to one of his students of his pastor's college, one crushing stroke has sometimes laid the minister very low. The brother must, uh, <clears throat> the brother most relied upon becomes a traitor. Ten years of toil cannot take so much life out of us as those as we lose in those few hours with Ahithophel, the traitor, or Demas, the apostate. And he's saying that if you have someone who, who is a person you've relied upon and they become a traitor, that can take life out of you as if it had been years of toil in a short period of time. Charles Spurgeon also battled with depression on and off from age 24. And he described it, it says, my spirits uh, were sunken so low that I could weep by the hour like a child. And yet I knew not for what I wept. He, he, he struggled with depression all his life. And, and that's, that's, that's quite well publicized. But isn't it incredible that someone who battled with depression actually accomplished so incredibly much in life? And it just gives hope that sometimes, you know, sometimes God gives us the strength to keep going despite the stuff. He also battled with illness. He suffered from gout, rheumatism, and Bright's disease, which is an inflammation of the kidneys. Uh, his first attack of gout came age 35. And, uh, and I quote, approximately one third of the last 22 years of his ministry were spent out of the tabernacle pulpit, either suffering or convalescing or taking precautions against the return of illness. He often wintered in Mentor in the south of France simply because it was better for his health. And he eventually died in Mentone in 1892. Well, there's the famous Charles Spurgeon. Well, we're going to bring it into land there, folks. And I'm just going to open up to the floor again. It's 28 minutes past nine. And I want to give an opportunity just now, if any of you have any questions or any comments you'd like to make. And uh, we've covered a lot of heroes, a lot of great people who have made a big difference. Love to hear any thoughts or reflections you've got. Uh, again, Keith, if there's anyone on Facebook with any questions or comments, uh, welcome there, welcome their thoughts. And if not, we'll come into land and pray. But yeah, just give it, just give a moment or two for any of your reflections back. In fact, what would be great is that while people are thinking of questions, on the chat function, and again on Facebook as well, why not just type down, what is it this evening? What has impacted you most? Maybe it's been one particular leader, maybe it's been a truth that you've heard or a principle or something that's maybe challenged you or a different insight into a new, into, into something you knew about before, but it's like a new perspective on it. Love to hear your reflections back. What is it that has impacted your life most tonight? And also any questions you've got as well. So uh, I'll wait for a minute to see what comes up in the chat. Anything there, Keith, on Facebook? Uh, nothing in Facebook, Pete. No I have to say, when you started talking about George Muller, he, I wrote George Muller, you know, great man of faith and prayer. Um, I, I, I learned about George Muller ages ago in my early years as a Christian. Mm. And, and I learned from it every day because he's, it, 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 I hang on to the fact that I, I need to have that great faith and I need to have that great prayer life to be able to, live my life as a Christian 
and 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 it was just so amazing that he he wanted for nothing he had such a faith that he knew that if he went to the lord in prayer that the lord was going to provide for him i mean the lord was was already lining up stuff before he even prayed i mean some of the stories that, that you hear about george muller's life's just fantastic you know fogs clearing from the sea so you can go and um give a sermon and stuff like that and, and, and the captain of the ship thinking there's no way we're going to get you there in time and and george muller said well let's pray and they went back upstairs you know this fog had gone just gone um, great great man at, at faith and prayer yeah and, and amazing and you know it's, it's one thing having faith for your own life but if you've got you imagine having thousands of orphans you're responsible for and it's 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 not just your life here it's god their lives are on the line and it, it's that's incredible faith isn't it absolutely yeah. So I'm seeing uh, Anne, thanks for your comment. George Muller's prayer life, absolutely. Vanessa, overall inspired by individuals. That's a pleasure, Vanessa. I'm glad that's inspired you. Do you know, um, we're culminating, as you know, on the Sundays, we've been covering, we've been looking at some of the highlights of the period of history that we're in. And uh, on Sunday just there, we looked at um, William Seymour, and the Azuzu Street Revival. Can I encourage you, if you missed Sunday's message, please go onto fa uh, Facebook or YouTube and find Sunday's message, or you can listen to the podcast. William Seymour, if you, of all the people who, in 2000 years of church history, William Seymour is the one who inspires me more than anyone else. So I'd encourage you, if you want to hear about William Seymour, I'll touch on him briefly next week in the lecture, but if you want to hear the detail of his life, go on to uh, Sunday's message. And also to say, we're going to culminate the series uh, in, a, in a couple of Sundays time with, so next Sunday, we're going to be looking at the life of Watchman Nee, uh, a great Chinese leader. And then we're going to end uh, with someone who's currently alive. So church history doesn't need to be people who are all dead. So we're going to end on the last Sunday with an interview with Jackie Pullinger. So Jackie Pullinger, who is incredible leader in Hong Kong. Awesome and seeing great miracles and people coming free from addiction. Uh, I, I'm doing this interview with her, and that's going to be in our in our physical church service uh, on the Sunday, and it will also be on church online. So, and so again, she, she just represents how the charismatic movement isn't just about goosebumps, but it's about setting people free from addiction and seeing great things happen against that fruit that impacts society. Uh, brilliant. Let's, let's see the comments that are coming in. So Ivy, George Muller in the Mission Without Walls, uh, great, being the Great Commission, going and make disciples. All these people were doing that with the gifts that God had given them. Absolutely, Ivy. Thank you. Charlie, extraordinary what most of these men, uh, the, the most of them were impacted at a young age. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, an age when I was personally full of my myself, my own priorities. Yeah, I think a lot of us were, Charlie. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's fascinating to see that many of these leaders we're looking at. It was from the youngest age. Watchman Nee, who we're looking at this Sunday, planted his... He started writing age 17. He got saved age 17. He started writing age 17. And Watchman Nee's produced so many books. But he planted his first church age 19. <laughs> Incredible. Um. Uh, Serena, thank you. Uh, Mula, thanking God for breakfast before it even arrived. <laughs> Absolutely. Imagine that. God, thank you for this food that you're going to provide. Such confidence. Such incredible confidence. Brilliant, Tisha. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much. Well, folks, it's been a joy to hang out with you this evening. Uh, let's let's take a moment to, to pray. In fact, Ivy, can I ask you, uh, would you mind praying on our behalf? Let's just thank God for what we've heard and just pray blessing on everyone as we go our separate ways. Thank you so much. Gracious and eternal Father, we thank you for a time like this. A time that you have brought to us the lives and the things that people today have done. Not Bible days, but today have done to show us that you are still alive and you are working in men even today. We thank you for your word springing 
forth truth and life and confidence. And we ask that even as we have heard what you have done in the lives of these men and women, that we are encouraged to do same with the gifts that you have given to us. Nothing is too small, nothing is too big. And even as we have heard what you have had for us today, let us also go and make disciples like you have made disciples of all these men that we have heard of. Let us go and make disciples, preach the gospel, let people believe in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, be baptized and be saved. So as we go forth, we ask that you continue with us, being the one that goes before us, continuing to be with us and being our rear guard, even as the name of Jesus Christ is continuously lifted up in all our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks, Ivy. Well, a joy to hang out with you folks. Thanks for joining me this evening.